You're listening to Health Innovators, a podcast and video show about the leaders, influencers, and early adopters who are shaping the future of healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy Mooney. Welcome back, Health Innovators. On today's episode, I am sitting down with Lydia Zeller, who's the president and CEO of Keo. Welcome to the show, Lydia. Hello, Dr. Roxy. A pleasure. Thank you. I am so excited to have this conversation with you today. Um, Before we get started into the details of your commercialization journey, maybe just give our listeners and viewers a little bit of information about your background and what you've been innovating these days. Fantastic. Uh, Keo is a digital therapeutic company providing next generation musculoskeletal care. So we have an on-demand digital first solution that guides individuals through a very personalized evidence-based care program specific to their type of pain, including exercise, education, digital support, and the uh, ability to interact one-on-one with a human being. Um, One key differentiator for Keo is that we are using software to deliver care. So this is not virtualization of one-to-one clinical care, but yeah. really leveraging the power of technology to provide immediate on-demand uh, accessible care. We sell B2B to health insurance companies and large employers. And then our, our solution is made available to their membership. And what about your background? Yeah, I have kind of an interesting uh, non-standard career path. I uh, began actually in a a niche wealth management firm on the operations side out in the San Francisco area. Uh, Then uh, when my twins were born, took a number, actually quite a few years um, out of, uh, you know, the more more standard career path, did consulting in FEC regulatory management. I began at Keo actually as a volunteer uh, right after Keo was founded. Uh, wow, in 2012. Yeah, uh, my <laughs> husband. That's was about trying. a story of working your way up. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, well, I think it's an inspirational story. I, I'm just going to take a, take a step back for a second and say I think um, women sometimes and men who take time out of their uh, out of their career to raise kids. Uh, maybe to do something a little bit different while my kids were growing up um, and we actually homeschooled them all the way until they, they began college. Uh, I, and I, so I did consulting during that period in, in SEC regulation. But I think we undervalue the skill sets that are developed uh, in, in non-standard times during our lives. Sure. Um, and I think that as a, as a leader, being really looking at people and seeing more than just a paper resume, understanding skills, and then being able to provide that mentorship uh, and opportunity to really um, recognize star potential and and nurture and develop that. I think that's something that all of us as leaders need to pay a lot of attention to. Well, you know, it's really interesting. I'm um, that's it's, it's not necessarily the, the focus or topic of our show, but I'm also a professor of gender leadership. And so I've, I've studied and I teach a lot about what's happening in the workforce and what's happening with um, women in the workforce and kind of this gap that we have in the C-suite with female um, leaders. And, you know, one of the biggest reasons why we have so few leaders up at the top that are female is because um, a lot of women are stepping away for a decade or maybe longer um, to be able to be moms um, and and not focus as much on their career. And then when they reconnect into the workforce, it's usually just really difficult to be able to work their way up. So what an incredible and inspiring story. Yes, absolutely. Tell us more. (laughs) Absolutely. And, and I've certainly benefited from, um, from some fantastic mentors uh, dur- during my career. Uh, so uh, when I joined Keo, I, I wore multiple hats in our early years, um, really working in almost all areas of the company. I believe I was uh, employee number three, maybe. Um, af- after my, my volunteering became, you know, 60 hours a week of volunteering, <laughs> I, I was hired. Um, and, and again, worked in, in multiple areas. I did most things other than you know software development wound up in product and Keo did a did a very is really a different company today than we were when we started so Keo was founded on the premise of bringing uh, 
evidence-based uh, and member-centric care to physical therapy, but developing a hardware sensor to uh, very precisely quantify muscle deficit, and then a content library of over 1,800 fully animated therapeutic exercises that a provider could tailor to the specific patient needs, deliver mm -hmm. a very personalized home exercise program to the mobile device of the patient, get feedback back remotely. Uh, that original business plan was flawed uh, from, from the perspective that we were reducing top line revenue for our prospective clients, yeah. uh, which is just in the fee for service business model. It, it just, the economics were not there. So I was asked at the end of 2016, I was product strategy at that point to take a look at our technology, to take a look at uh, where we felt healthcare is headed, Yep. Um, what is really interesting and new in care delivery models, how we can really leverage the best of technology, evidence-based care, uh, behavioral economics, consumer uh, motivators, what consumers are wanting, and really develop a product that, that skates to where the puck is headed. Yep. That was the genesis of our pivot into digital therapeutics and our shift in market focus to selling to the at-risk entities, so payers. So how has that pivot paid off in the last three to four years? <laughs> it's been a fantastic success. We've, we've never looked back. So uh, we launched with our first health plan client at the beginning of 2017, mm -hmm. have added clients nationally since then. Um, we made an intentional, we, we, we don't even operate in the, in the original business uh, yeah. as uh, listeners will, will understand as a small company focus is, is critical. You can't be doing too many different things. We still right. have the technology. Um, it's the basis, um, that our, the foundation that our digital therapeutic was, um, built off of. Uh, but right now we're not focusing on that. So when you kind of look back at your commercialization journey, um, maybe before, even after the pivot, you know, what are some of the, you know, and I think you already touched on one, but what are some of the key decisions that you made uh, that you think really made a difference in, in the success that you've been able to achieve to date? Yes, absolutely. Well, it, it's, it's, this sounds so simple, but but when I have conversations with people founding companies, um, sometimes you wonder whether it's really been properly thought through. And and to be honest, I don't think we properly thought that through in our original business premise. Yeah. Um, you really need to make sure that you have spoken uh, had multiple times with multiple people um, in your. In, in, in both your uh, both your client prospective clients as well as prospective end users if if they're not the same as your client so really yep. understanding the pain points of the market that you want to serve understanding how you're going to differentiate within that market how you're going to in in the case of a digital therapeutic make sure that you're getting the end users to engage with you because you can have a wonderful product and if nobody uses it it isn't going to bring any value, right? So truly understanding the market and all the stakeholders in the market, all of your users. Um, and then also just as importantly, making sure that you have aligned economic interests. Because even if you're developing a product that serves needs, people enjoy using, et cetera, if you're not aligning those economic interests, and we all know that <laughs> alignment of economic interests in healthcare is a pretty <laughs> complex <laughs> beast and not as easy to attain uh, as one might think. Yep, yep. <laughs> and for, and for, right, even, even the payment structure. So for example, um, Keo can invoice our clients directly, but we can also bill through the claim system using CPT codes. And that makes it so much easier, particularly for our employer clients. Yeah, yeah. So you touched on something I'd love for you to kind of just dig in a little bit deeper when you talked about, um, you know, the adoption of the technology. So I think you touched on something that's so important is that really 
closing um, a sale, right, and getting a client to buy the solution is is definitely not the end point. I think we know that, but it's it's also in a lot of ways um, a beginning point as well. Um, so, do you have any of those adoption strategies that maybe have worked really well for you guys, or how you have looked at that being a key ingredient to your commercial success? That's a fantastic point, Dr. Roxy. Absolutely. And we've we've continued to learn and continued to improve in that area from the beginning. So I'll give you an example. Um, In our very first implementations, Keo did not have the capabilities to run the awareness campaigns in the members of our clients. So our first health plan clients. So we relied on the plans themselves to run those campaigns. Um, we quickly learned that having those capabilities um, was critical to driving engagement. Yeah. Uh, and and so so Keo runs those campaigns and we've attained really fantastic engagement um, in an employer population. We will capture between 20 and 45 percent of the addressable population in health plan population. It's always lower, more like 10 percent. Um, primarily because health plans don't have as great contact information for their for their memberships as as employers typically do. Um, We always like to work synergistically together with our clients so that we are um, utilizing client specific channels as well as email, direct mail, um, potentially text uh, on the Keo side. And, and, you know, it's, it's how you craft the awareness campaign that really determines uh, its success. And so we've continually over the years um, cap- increased our capture rates, mm-hmm. lessons learned. Now, a lot of that's the right. secret sauce of a company, right? I mean, you talk right. about uh, what's differentiation, what's secret sauce, and, and those campaigns are, you know, definitely play into that. We really learned that engagement doesn't begin. Um, I, I think this was maybe the most critical learning uh, and, and it's, it's, it's a pretty simple one, but engagement doesn't begin with the first time the member uses our app, right? It begins with the first time they learn about us and how that message is framed, what information is provided to the member, what are the reasons to believe, what's the yeah. tone, is it, is it a joyful message um, versus a scary message, right? I mean, we're in pain management. Sure. Um, you, you can craft a message that shows people in pain, reduce your pain, or you can craft a more joyful message about hope and, and empowerment, right? And they, they have a very different impact on sure. members. So really thinking about engagement as, as starting right at the beginning and making sure you're setting the tone that, that, uh, that you want right from the beginning. Well, you guys have um, achieved so much success. You must have, um, and, and I love that you talk about how and transparently and candidly that, you know, you didn't have it all figured out in the beginning. And like all of us, you know, you're learning along the way. And, you know, obviously you're following some best practices um, right out of the gate, but then you're learning um, about maybe specific patient populations or member populations within different health plans and being able to continue to shape that. I mean, because right now, I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of really amazing technologies out there that are like dusty cobwebs, right? So the engagement piece is such a critical component of of the commercial success. So um, I I won't ask you any more details, so you don't have to disclose any more about your secret sauce. (laughs) I love one thing that you just mentioned there, which is not only the continuing to learn, but that your strategy may be different in different populations. So we had a wonderful success. Um, Kyo has worked with um, both both our employer groups, but then across all lines of business in our health plan clients. So uh, not only commercial, uh, but also Medicare Advantage and Medicaid and Marketplace. Um, And, you know, you don't provide quite the same messaging into your Medicare Advantage that you do into your Medicaid or your commercial, right? You want to be sensitive to your audience. Um, We put out a press release with one of our health plan clients recently, Children's Community Health Plan, who offers uh, Medicaid as well as Marketplace. And we did a relaunch with them um, towards the end of 2020 and saw incredible results in their Medicaid population. That's a really challenging population to engage because that population has so many challenges in their daily lives. And Children's 
um, really wanted to provide um, a fully covered, there's, there's, there's no copay or deductible for access to Keo, provide very accessible, um, broadly applicable care to these vulnerable members in a time of great need, right? Because COVID has been, you know, particularly challenging for, um, for these populations. And we were just so pleased with the uptake. I mean, it really highlights the need, but also that ability of the, uh, the vendor and the plan to work together and successfully engage that population. Yeah. And we've seen fantastic results. That's amazing. That's really wonderful. Um, so, so I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, proving ROI. So this is something that, you know, um, you'd communicated to me before. That was something that was really important um, and critical for uh, Keo. And, and I want to just talk about that a little bit more because a lot of times we have clients um, or we have companies that are even guests on the show and they're talking about their value proposition. They're talking about how we lower cost. And, you know, it's one thing to say that we improve outcomes, increase member satisfaction and lower costs, right? The trifecta there. Um, but having the evidence to back up the claims that we're making is, is a real game changer for the business. So what was that like in the beginning, trying to develop uh, and build up that evidence? And then how has it been, um, you know, kind of either another um, weapon in your arsenal, or how has it helped you really kind of create that competitive advantage? That's a fantastic question. Thank you. Yes. And that would be another piece of advice I would have is start those early because they take a while to achieve. And in your initial contracts, try to build in um, a collaboration around actually examining ROI. So in our case, uh, we, um, we formed great partnerships with our, with our early health plan clients. They wanted to look at that ROI too. So they agreed to send us claims data. Um, so what we did is three at this point now, longitudinal claims database studies, uh, looking, quantifying the, uh, the medical utilization and spend in Keo participants versus non-Keo participants, a uh, statistically similar reference group. And we found um, very significant results. So um, between 42 and 70% lower back pain related medical spend in Keo participants. We examined particular areas that are um, quite impactful. So for example, urgent care, we have over a 90% reduction in urgent care in, in Keo participants really related to our immediacy. Uh, in one study, a 79% reduction in filled opioid prescriptions compared to a 1% reduction in the reference group. In a second study, a 24% reduction in uh, opioid prescriptions in Keo participants, uh, decreases in MRIs, in injections, in surgeries, uh, benzodiazepines, <laughs> ablation, all of these um, overutilized and expensive diagnostics yeah. and treatments that don't just cost money is that they can actually do harm, right? Yeah, if, if, yeah. if you have a surgery when you don't need a surgery, you're, you're actually doing harm to that patient. Oh, it's life-changing. Yeah. It is. Absolutely. So, um, so having that proof, so that's hard ROI. That's ROI actually looking at the claims data. That's very, very, very different than ROI calculations that are based on either a predictive model. Yeah. For example, studies show that PT um, delivers X percent savings as compared to traditional care. Um, we feel that we are Y percent better than PT, so you will have an ROI of Z, right? That's yeah. just a predictive model. The other um, type of ROI discussion that gets um, bandied around is ROI based on self-reported likeliness to consume services. And again, that's just very different <laughs> when it comes to how evidence-based is this and actually looking at somebody's claims data. Yeah. Um, so, so that has, has been tremendously beneficial to us um, as well as to our clients and, um, and certainly is a, is a strong differentiator in the sales process. 
So there's two things that you mentioned that I want to kind of go back to that I think would be really important for our viewers and our listeners to um, kind of kn know a little bit more about. One is um, the, the agreement with those early customers, whether they're pilots or proof of concept customers or whether they're, you know, full blown, just early stage customers. What are some of the important things that need to be included in those agreements up front? Because a lot of times I'm speaking with innovators and they're just so, ex they're either so desperate or so excited to have one of their target customers say yes, that they often forget about the negotiation power that they still have at the table, even with those early customers. So often they might have a couple of pilots or a couple of early customers, but they still don't have the evidence that they need. Need because they didn't negotiate those those um, you know data elements up front. So just touch on that a little bit, um, you know, to kind of help our audience. Absolutely, um, and and obviously in certain contracts uh, you have more or less leverage, right? Sure. In, our, in our very first one, it wasn't actually written into the contract. We just developed um, over that uh, year such a close relationship because. Uh, one thing that really stands out with Keo is how much we care about our clients. We are good partners. Yeah, um, We've got some fantastic quotes about being a dream to work with or phenomenal to work with. I'm on hugging terms with, with the majority <laughs> of our clients. Um, so, so <laughs> you know, a trust before COVID, <laughs> right? Before COVID. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Before COVID. And hopefully coming again one of these days. Right, right. Um, yeah. But so, so uh, even though it wasn't in the contract, we were able to come to an agreement when it was time to do that claims analysis. And, and they yeah. did provide the data. It was sent off to a third party analyst and, and we were able to provide them with analysis. And that was very beneficial to them as well. Actually, in that case, uh, Keo was their first digital solution. We've become the model for their entire population health management strategy on the digital side. Um, so they learned from us too. Um, yeah. In yep. that regard, previously, none of their programs had measurable ROI. Yeah, yeah. I and think that's the really good point. Point. Right. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point because whoever's the internal champion of this initiative, you know, they have just as much to gain as you do, right, to be able to demonstrate that real tangible ROI. Absolutely, absolutely. You can usually find a way to put it in the contract that is, um, palatable for both parties. So for example, one of the contracts we just wrote, um, we, we always have in there that they will share data with us. We will share the analysis back with them. Um, and then we have the right to use uh, that data in an anonymized format. Um, yeah. we, we won't publish it using their logo without their permission, um, but we can use it as long as it can't be linked back to them. Um, I can't wait for healthcare to change that. I mean, <laughs> you know, when you think about the possibilities in other industries, when you have success um, and, you know, to be able to like shout that from the rooftops of like such and such clients specifically, you know, had these results. And then you get into healthcare with health plans and hospital systems and they're like, just don't use my logo or my name. <laughs> yes. Yes. Over time though, what we found is, is that trust is built and, and yeah. they do let you use their, yeah. their logo yeah. and their name uh -huh. because they're proud of it as well. It sure. shows exactly. innovative leadership um, on their part as well. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. Hey, it's Dr. Roxy here with a quick break from the conversation. Are you trying to figure out what moves you need to make to survive and thrive in the new COVID economy? I want every health innovator to find their most viable and profitable pivot strategy, which is why I created the COVID Proof Your Business Pivot Kit. The Pivot Kit is a step-by-step -step framework that helps you find your best pivot strategy. It walks you through six categories you need to examine for a 360 degree view of your business. I call them the six critical pivot lenses. As you make your way through this comprehensive kit, you'll be armed with the tools, tips, and strategies you need to make sure you can pivot with speed without missing out on critical details and opportunities. Learn more at legacy-dna.com backslash kit.
So some of the things I usually, um, you know, kind of encourage innovators early on to start thinking about is, you know, what are those key metrics? What are those key data elements that they need and, and make that part of that contracting process up front? Um, and then even, you know, from a sales standpoint of, you know, like, what do you want to happen next? So if A, B and C happen, well, how does like, what are the next steps? Um you know, is that like a, a program extension? Is it a program expansion? And, you know, it may not always be the right thing to include, you know, in that contract up front, but sometimes it is, and it can help you, you know, for residual income or long-term client relationships, being able to have that up front. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, you know, obviously we, we, we try to do full contracts as opposed to pilot contracts, but with the jumbos, you know, they often will want to wade in the pilot and making sure that you mutually understand what are the, um, what are the metrics for success? How are we measuring success of this program? And then as you, to your point, what are the next steps for moving past pilot into a broader expansion? Yep. So the second thing that you mentioned that I think is really important is patience. Um, so the other thing that I often hear from innovators is, um, you know, like I just, I don't have the resources right now at this early in our company to invest in these types of studies. Um, you know, we'll do that down the road. And I, and, and, and I think the patients as well as the resources that are required to be able to facilitate something like this, but I think for every single one that, um, overlook that or think that they're going to do that later is really doing themselves a disservice because it's such a key ingredient to the commercial success. It's like, you got to do it as you got to start it as soon as you can. So just talk about the patience and then maybe even the resource side of that. No, that's a great question. Um, it does take a long time because to do a, to a, do a good claims database study, um, and I want to be clear, this is not a randomized controlled trial, right? That's right, actually right. less effective in a, when you're looking at uh, the economics in a, in, a, in a population because people behave differently if they are in a clinical trial than they do just in, a, in, a, in normal life. So what we're right. looking at is when this program is offered in a real population, what happens, who engages, and what happens in their claims data? Yep. So uh, you don't have the costs in this type of study th that you would have with a, with a RCT, um, but it does take time. So to do a good job of it, you really want one year of claims data post enrollment, and then you need to wait for the claims to filter in. So really, you know, you can't even begin to do the analysis for about 14 months, 14, yeah. 14 months after you began the program. Um, so, so it's a, it's, it's a time commitment. Um, the, the resources to do it, though, there are definitely uh, very skilled uh, uh, health economists, people who will do contract under the AA to do a, um, a claims analysis for you. It doesn't have to be resources from within the company. Sure, sure. Yep. Um, I was thinking more along the lines of funding, <laughs> not people resources, um, especially for some of these earlier stage startups. Um, but again, I think that, you know, when you're talking about the, the capital that you have to work with, or when you're talking about raising funds to be able to build and grow the company, that, you know, the, having that clinical evidence um, should be part of the plan absolutely from the beginning, right? We need to be able to fund that just as much as we need to be able to fund the development of the technology solution. Absolutely. Money very well spent. Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, so you've also talked in the past a lot about culture and how important culture is. Um, and, you know, for someone like yourself, who was an, um, you know, one of the early employees and then, you know, worked your way up and has been leading the company um, for a while now, um, talk about how the culture, how important the culture you, has been to your commercial success, and then maybe how it's evolved and some of the, maybe even the challenges that you faced, um, because it's it's very different to um, build and cultivate a culture with ten, a team of 10 versus a team of 50 or 100 or even more. So just kind of tell us a little bit um, about that, your experience with that. I love that question. It's something I actually think about quite a bit. Um, so Keo has grown quite a bit in the last year. Um, we historically have had uh, very long employee retention, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
people just do not leave Keo. Uh, we we really have a sense of family uh, yeah. in our company, and that sense of family, the sense of values, um, the the deep caring that we have for both our clients and our members um, is is integral is integral to the company and is something that is really, really, really important to me to retain as we scale. And that's not necessarily an easy thing. I know many companies who have struggled with um, maintaining that level of partnership about of being an outstanding partner to your clients and your members as they scale and grow rapidly. And I think a big part of that is looking carefully um, at your hires, at the um, at what type of environment do, do people want to be in? Uh, we, you know, the, if you ask Keo folks, it'll be we want to be doing something that we're passionate about, where we know that we're helping people. That's really important to them. They want to see the impact that we're having. They want to work hard but have fun and be yeah. in a collaborative, supportive <laughs> environment. Doing that um, yeah. and just thinking through that as you're adding team members is really important. But, you know, it's also fantastic bringing in new team members um, because you're bringing in new perspectives, right? Yeah. And you're bringing in both different experiences and different perspectives. And we actually now, I mean, look what COVID has done. We, all of our team members were in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, back at the beginning of 2020, we have folks all over the country now. We have folks in Boston and San Francisco and Seattle and Twin Cities and Austin. And, you know, if you would have asked me two years ago, could our head of product not be physically located with the development team? I would have said, no, I don't think that's going to work. Right, right, right. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and I think you're in good company. I mean, I would say that majority of the healthcare market um, as a whole and and, and the leaders have had to reimagine what's possible because of COVID um, in, in being thrusted into this remote world. Um, and, and, and virtual selling or, you know, distance selling, and then also leading teams um, in a virtual environment. So our company's been virtual from day one. So for the past 11 years, and there's a number of things that I just really love about it. One is that, you know, I'm not forced to just tap into talent that's local. So, I mean, wow, right? When you open up the country or even the world, right? So we don't even have to, you know, focus just on national borders. Man, the amount of perspective in in talent that you're able to tap into is just incredible. Um, And then also even from a client standpoint too, um, you know, you're able to get to work with so many amazing people um, around the country or around the world when you're not just really focused um, local. I mean, local businesses are great, but it's just nice to not have those uh, boundaries or borders sometimes too. Absolutely. It's one of the things that defines our product, right? We're not geographically bound. As a digital solution, we can provide, you know, outstanding musculoskeletal care to your members across the country, right? Not just in one, not tied to brick and mortar boundaries. And, you know, so it's been fantastic to be (laughs) the same in our own team. I think that's such, it's so ironic, right? It's like, oh no, with your customers and your users, like, no, 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 you don't even need these geographical boundaries. But we thought we did as an organization in order to operate and function. And now we realize like, no, the users don't need those boundaries and neither do we. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, that's great. So before we wrap up here, I want to, um, you know, just kind of brainstorm a challenge that I think a lot of folks have that we really haven't talked about on the show. um, I don't think really at all um, is, you know, even even as the company grows, sometimes the the, the profits that the company has um, developed get reinvested into the technology or uh, the product, right? Or or maybe even um, human capital. Um, and so very often it leaves marketing teams with limited budgets and limited resources. Or you might be in the early stages where you're you know you're just still working with a really small or limited budget. So that, you know, the challenge is how do you um, really expand awareness and word of mouth with such a small budget to work with? Um, and I think a lot of few folks in the, in the audience here will have experienced that challenge. Um, is, is that something that you guys have faced at some point? Um, and, and then let's just talk about that. It, that, I, I love that. That absolutely is something that, that we have faced and, and still face to some extent. So 
uh, between 2017, when we launched our product, and uh, mid-2020, when we closed a funding round and were really able to uh, start growing uh, from, a, from a human capital perspective, we had no sales or marketing. So all of those accounts were closed by Mia's product. Um, yep. And, and that's just really, really challenging. I like to say that we are the best kept secret in digital musculoskeletal care. We have been around <laughs> since 2017. We've really established clinical outcomes. We have yep. established hard ROI claims data based outcomes. And yet we um, have had almost no marketing. So yep. our, our yep. brand visibility is, is very low at this point. Yep. And the yep. I just brought in, um, in January, a fantastic head of marketing and her key focus on the B2B side is raising that brand visibility, right? Yeah. Telling people about Keo, sharing Keo and uh, sharing our vision, sharing what we've accomplished, how we can help you. And she still has fairly limited resources, <laughs> um, but yeah. really trying to use social media, trying to use our clients who are wonderful advocates for us, doing press releases for them, uh, with, with us publishing, you know, pu putting out their uh, information about our, our uh, outcomes, getting members to do, to share testimonials, which many of them are, are eager to do. Um, yeah. all, those things, um, all of those things can help. I, I'm curious what are some of your thoughts are as well. Yeah. So, so what you just said is so critical because evidence shows that the way, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the book, Crossing the Chasm, right? Where you've got a lot of companies that um, have some success with the early market, right? They can get early market customers. They can penetrate that first 16% of their target market, but crossing over that chasm is where they really you know, just statistically fall short and really struggle to be able to like build and grow and scale the company. And a lot of the evidence shows um, that one of the ways to be able to overcome that is to be able to make sure that your early customers are raving fans and that you are facilitating that advocacy you're facilitating that word of mouth marketing and promotion. So a lot of times we'll have clients um, or customers that are raving fans, but we might not be leveraging that to the fullest extent. So, um, you know, when I'm working with folks, we divide the, uh, in every single target market into that diffusion of innovation curve where, you know, the first 16% are, you know, they're going to be attracted to different messages, different value propositions, different product configurations. Those are the ones that want the new, the exciting, never been done before. As you start to grow after you penetrate those, now you're getting into a different market segment, which is that mainstream market where they tend to be a little bit more um, risk averse. And they don't want anything that's new and revolutionary and never been done before. So the only way you're going to be able to get those people to buy is going to be for those peers in their community um, to be able to say how this is trusted, this becomes standard process, right? And so that messaging shift and, and then being able to leverage those early customers to be able to promote that, like those are, so it's really more of those early customers with the word of mouth more so than it is even the brand that helps cross that chasm into the other market segment. And a lot of people um, overlook the, the critical um, significance of, of that distinction. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I think that's fantastic advice. And, and if you can, if your uh, champion clients are armed with actual. Yeah. Study, yeah, yeah, exactly. So the clinical, right. So the clinical evidence, like, absolutely, you guys are on to that. Um, the testimonials, um, you know, one thing that I'm a huge advocate for is video testimonials. I think that those are so much more powerful than static testimonials or text based with a picture. Um, there's tools out there like video peel, um, video P E E L dot com that help facilitate the, the collection of those. They get really easy. 
right? So, you know, in my experience, when you sell, you ask a customer to like, hey, can you give me a testimonial? They're like, yeah, sure. But then they never get to it, right? Um, and when you use a tool like this, where you send them a text message, that's a link that then opens the camera on their phone and gives them the prompt of the three questions to ask, like all of a sudden your um, participation rate in those video testimonials seem to increase um, pretty heavily. And they even have an integration into your website to where, um, you know, you can pop those onto the website, like really, really easy. Um, so video testimonials is something that um, I'm always advocating for, even if it takes time and effort and getting folks to do it. It's it's worth poking them and probing them a number of times to kind of get that. Um, because when someone, you know, when the brand says ABC, that's completely different when one of their peers in the community, um, you know, says something so seeing that on video, the other thing that I think is off, like just so often overlooked in healthcare is the power of the Google business page. Um, and, and so a lot of times com- healthcare brands will have a Google business page, but it's like literally like their address and their phone number, maybe even a description, but they're not really leveraging that to the fullest. Um, and so we were working with a client not that long ago and created a, um, a campaign where we um, launched a customer satisfaction survey. And if they were satisfied, we routed them to the Google business page to post a review. If they weren't satisfied, we routed them to the um, team that needed to troubleshoot that and investigate what was going on and solve that problem. And it might have been with a, you know, like just a fluke um, single instance, or it might have been something major that really needed to change in, in the business or the business model or, you know, how things are being executed. And that Google business ranking shot through the roof. And then that's a huge competitive advantage. And then, of course, you know, Google and the algorithm is going to put so much more weight on the pages that are um, have all of those reviews. Right. So now you're talking about like organic free SEO when someone's going online to search for a solution like yours. You know, your page is going to rank really high because you've got all of those um, reviews instead of um, cobwebs there. So I, I want to share that with you and, and also share that with our viewers and our listeners, because I think like that's a free thing um, that you can do that can have a lot of real business um, and marketing impact. Fantastic advice. Yeah. Um, so Lydia, is there anything else that you would want to share with our um, audience today before we wrap up? Just that what an incredible space we're in, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's changed even so, even so much in the last year. You know, this, this year has been so challenging for so many people, yeah. but has just heightened the interest and the acceleration and the adoption of digital health care. Sure. And I, I truly believe the future is so bright. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Seize the day, right? For those of us that are in this market, um, it's it, it is um, it's a very exciting time to see that ton of accelerated adoption, because I think we'll really truly um, be able to transform the healthcare industry in a way that we might have just really suffered through a little bit more for another 10 years, right? Um, we're just, we're, we're really going to be able to transform lives in a whole different way um, because of the acceleration of the adoption of digital health. Yes. And I think that, you know, previously you, we've had employers really helping drive that acceleration. And now we have the added benefit of an actual pull from members, from consumers, as opposed to it being pushed. And and that pull from consumers is going to be very, very, very powerful. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. So if anyone wants to speak to you um, about your commercialization journey or even about your um, solution, how will they get a hold of you? Absolutely. Um, You can contact me through our our website, keo.com, or email me, lzeller at keo.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been a very rich and um, fun conversation today. Likewise. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. 
Thank you so much for listening. I know you're busy working to bring your life-changing innovation to market, and I value your time and attention. To get the latest episodes on your mobile device automatically, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Thank you for listening, and I appreciate everyone who shared the show with friends and colleagues. See you on the next episode of Health Innovators.